I was beaten up every day. I had no off day. They made me work in home and office. I was deceived. Singapore is a city-state with one of the busiest commercial hubs in the world. It is known globally as a successful economic powerhouse, seeing a large percentage of its population participating in the labour market. 75% of males and 58% of females contribute to this burgeoning workforce. With fewer Singaporeans having children, the country is projected to have a higher than average elderly population of 18.7% by the year 2030. With busy families participating in the labour force, there has been a growing need for foreign domestic workers to engage in household chores. At any one time, there are more than 200,000 foreign domestic workers working in Singaporean homes. These workers form the backbone of the Singaporean economy, carrying out domestic, childcare and elder care duties while Singaporean families are engaged in the workforce. They leave their young children behind to look after ours. Coming to Singapore is a dream for many foreign domestic workers. They come here to hear of the great values and policies that this country upholds and hope their interests as employees in Singapore will be cared for. For Rose, coming to Singapore was an easy choice. Having thought that this was the right decision, Rose took a loan to fund her work opportunity here in Singapore. She was confident the loan will be paid off and she will earn sufficiently to support her family back home. Four years on, Rose still has not been able to pay her debt back or send adequate returns back home. So what went wrong? Why hasn't she been able to clear her debt despite working in Singapore for four long years. Here's why. For most foreign domestic workers, their job scope is spelled out in a legally binding contract. This document specifies place of employment, the necessary provision of adequate food and shelter, a decent eight-hour rest and number of days off as well as the exact amount of salary to be paid every month. The terms of the contract establishes the expectations of both the employer and the employee and in ensuring that these expectations are legally protected. In Singapore, there's many laws that protect the rights of the domestic worker. All the rights is being spelled out in the MM contract and all employers are supposed to abide to all the rules. In case there's any single violations against any rights, employer will be put to task with the MOM and a $5,000 bond will be forfeited or imprisonment if the case is serious. So the laws are very good over in Singapore to protect the rights of domestic helpers. However, these are not always met. Many a times, foreign domestic workers are promised different salaries, employment conditions, and treatment during the recruitment process back in their home country or at the maid agency located in Singapore. They are coerced into signing contracts without having the opportunity to read them, are promised wages higher than they eventually receive and made to work far more hours than specified. By abusing their vulnerability, recruiters Agents and employers deceive foreign domestic workers into situations of exploitation. The harsh reality sets in for the domestic worker when they arrive at their place of work. They have now become victims of trafficking. Trafficking in the context of domestic work often translates to deception and abuse of vulnerability, particularly during the time of recruitment. Coercion as well as exploitation through physical, verbal and sexual abuse during employment are also indicators of trafficking. 
The Humanitarian Organization for Migration Economics, also known as HOME, is a non-governmental organization that houses traffic victims in Singapore. In 2012, HOME released a research report on trafficking in Singapore. 151 foreign domestic workers were interviewed, of which 149 women were found to have reflected in their interviews strong trafficking indicators, based on the definition of human trafficking by the international labour organisation known as ILO. 40% of the women interviewed were deceived on employment arrangements as well as wages and earnings. 88% of the women's vulnerable situations were abused. This included a lack of information provided by recruiters. 96% of these women were coerced into excessive working hours and had inadequate rest days. The women had low or no salary. Low means the salary was far lower than what they were promised, while some women were never paid for their work. And finally, coercive methods were used to get foreign domestic workers to pay their recruitment debts, for example, hefty salary deductions, confiscation of documents, and or isolation, confinement, and surveillance. All of these are construed as conditions of exploitation. Despite the Singapore law specifying very clearly the rights and terms of a foreign domestic worker employed in the country, there are many employers who are guilty of not respecting these agreements, often subjecting the foreign domestic worker to a violation of one or all of these terms of agreement in her contract. Based on Holmes' report in 2012, 96% of FDWs interviewed by Home had their documents confiscated, including copies of their contract. 78 of these 151 women were deceived about the content of the work contract. The contract protects the rights of both the worker and the employer, outlining specifically the FDW's right to food, shelter, days off, rest times, wages, place of residence and conditions of work. Deception about working conditions um, can occur when there's contract substitution. What happens is the domestic worker may sign a contract in her country of origin only for it to be replaced with another contract when she arrives in Singapore. And um, when this happens, the, the salary that's promised, the number, the number of days off that she's promised might be significantly different to what um, she, is, she, she has in Singapore in reality. Let's look at some of the legal clauses penned in the contract that the worker signs before she's employed. One of the first items the contract specifies is that the foreign domestic worker can only work in one residence. That will also be the only residence in which she resides. A violation of this is termed as illegal deployment. However, in the first and second quarter of 2014 alone, Home received 405 complaints on their help desk service. It was found that 51 complaints by multiple domestic workers were of illegal deployment. Let us hear Rosalind's story. I came last year. Last year, March 31. Oh, sorry, March 30. I came here. And I walk in, in my employer house. Okay. So what kind of work did you do? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm doing my work is uh, their business. Their business and making the sausage. So every day I make the 40 kg, 60 kg, 80 kg per day. So one man, after one, uh, one man is a... Uh, I'm making the sausages about 700 kg, at least 700 kg I'm making. You are very good for me. After that, he angry, after that, you are very stupid. You are very stupid, you never eat pot, that's why you don't have the brain. You never, you thinking about yourself only, you thinking about the not ourselves. I show you who I am. So you want to go, you want to go MOM? You want to go MOM yourself or I send to you MOM? You try two things, like this, like this, and uh, he blame me there. He blame me there. And uh, uh, boss, you agree? You agree with me before? You borrow, you pay more money. Until now, I never get more money. So I will pay you later, later. I will, uh, I will talk to you. But, but later you go home. Later you go home. I will pay you lah, like this, like this only. But actually never pay to me. 
I never get any more until now. I never get my salary, especially at my business, uh, business, uh, my business salary, 500. Despite the Ministry of Manpower, also known as MOM, specific guidelines on illegal deployment, employers still break this basic rule. Employers who illegally deploy their workers can be fined up to $5,000. In addition, the errant employer will be permanently barred from employing foreign domestic workers. The $5,000 security deposit posted with the MOM might also be forfeited. When Rosalind requested to seek aid from MOM, she was verbally abused and her employer threatened her. Restriction of movement, physical and verbal abuse are acts of coercive practices and therefore defined as trafficking. Homes Help Their Service received 159 of 405 complaints that were of verbal abuse, 49 reporting physical abuse and 10 reporting sexual harassment and or abuse. Su came to Singapore from Myanmar only to have found herself in an abusive work environment. Here is Su's story. Before I said, that is very good to me. After that, baby don't like me. That's why I take care of baby also. Baby and me cannot do that. That's why my employer also can get angry to me. And then they start to ask me to run in a house. The level room. Uh, every morning, ask me run uh, one hundred times, and then they say all this waste water because it one day only ask me dream three time and go to toilet only three time. If I dream water more than three time and more than three time go to toilet, they beat or abuse or ask me jump in the house. That's why um, they beat you. Yes, uh, like um, slip the face or like punch the face. If I my face is swollen, then they let us uh, press again and they become brown. Like if I go out, they ask me to wear a mask, then people cannot see me. And then if a cow, a ma come to the, my employer house, and then my employer ask me to stay inside the room, and then and then account cannot see me, account Amma cannot see me, that's why they asked me to hide inside the room. Sue's story was clearly an overt case of abusive conditions in the place of work, a punishable offence. Not paying your domestic worker is another example of contract violation. Like Sue, Maria came to Singapore with hopes of supporting her family, but instead she found herself overworked and underpaid. Sometimes, Workers are promised salaries much higher than they receive, while others are never paid, despite being overworked. Maria Luisa Culzon was featured in the new paper for being made to work like a slave, without getting paid. Not only was she denied her days off by her employer after two long years of working with them, but she was also never paid. Maria has been waiting for justice for over a year. She has been sheltered by home and has gone through a series of medical emergencies during this period. Ay, mahirap mag ano eh. Mag-isip nga parang itiway lang ang ano natin, ang tra trabaho. Ang hirap-hirap naman ang trabaho. Nya. Oo nya. Lakad ang lakad ka lang. Layo nga. Mag-deliver, mag tapos... Wala ang service? Wala, wala lakad lang ko. Ano kalaya? Oh, katong village, tapos mag-deliver pa ka ng legacy na pub. Tapos maganyan ka pa. Ilang minuto yun, halakad? Mga 30 minutes. Kung malakas ka lang maglakad, yun. At saka, dami pang i-deliver dyan. Nag-ano ng mga styropor. Bilis ka, maganyan. Dami dito. Magdala kong ganyan. Na mga... Styron, mga plastic dito, puno tong puno, maganyan ako eh. Tapos, punta ka pa ng Paramount, lalo nang magre ang mga pub, ay nako, mahirap, lapos ng daming order. She do everything. She wash the clothes she, of her sister so that she can find money. Everything so that she earn money for her ticket. 
and time comes, she get the money for the ticket. So she go. And then when she arrived there, she she called me. Mama, how much is your salary? Four hundred. Four hundred dollars. And then and she, I'll give you the half. Every time when she received the salary, she sent me the 200, so 200 will belongs to her. Oh, it's okay. Then time, times come. I was worried because I don't know why she did not give me money. And then when, when I called her, she said, that, Ma, I don't have any salary. Unfortunately, for domestic workers such as Maria, Investigation processes conducted by the Ministry of Manpower or the Singapore Police Force against errant employers can go on for up to two years or even more. During this time, workers like Maria are not guaranteed work, left penniless without any alternative sources of employment. For many of these women undergoing investigation, key questions regarding their access to food, legal aid, shelter, medical care and right to work are left unanswered. One of the concerns voiced by the women interviewed is of employment. During the investigation period, their need to find work is dire. During this period, these women not only face economic stress, but psychological stress as well. As they wait for justice, they miss their family and friends back home. Your children need money now to pay for school fees? Is that what you were saying? Yes. How many children are going to school right now? They are four. Four of them are going to school. Yeah. How much are the school fees? It's not the... It's they're going only in the public school. But they need to buy something in the school supplies, you know. The uniform. The daily needs. It's so how much are the expenses to send them to school each month? March I sent them two hundred because I get already my advance. Even my bread. So you had deductions up until month of February. Yeah, I get already advanced. My, my, I have an allowance, monthly allowance, 76. And then I get already that three months for done. So then your salary was how much? 576. 576. Did you receive that salary? No. Not a single time? No, not. I have no... I have no salary yet because I need to pay my agency six months. Many of them face acute mental stress from not having seen their children for years. The only desire for many of them is to return home to see their families. The sometimes endless wait time for investigations to complete puts them at further mental turmoil. Some employers accuse workers of stealing after an investigation is launched against them just to lengthen the process of investigation for the foreign domestic worker. For women that have been trafficked, the entire structural process to seek justice is arduous, at times adding even further complexity, stress and medical complications for the worker. Many prefer to return home instead of prosecuting their employers. This means that some of the women leave without receiving their dues for their time here in Singapore. For many of these women, Singapore offers hope to make a living for their families, to lift themselves out of poverty. For some women, this hope turns out to be a successful reality. But for others, this dream turns into a nightmare. Their fundamental rights as employees are violated, and they fail to obtain their just dues. So how can we as Singaporeans work towards creating a fairer and more just employment for foreign domestic workers in our country? How can we ensure that they are accorded their basic rights? Here is what we as Singaporeans can do. In ensuring the basic rights of domestic workers are respected, employers can ensure they follow these simple guidelines. 
always pay your domestic worker on time every month, ensure that all of her documents are hers to keep, including her passport, work permit and contract. Please do note that she receives her weekly day off. She has sufficient sleep every day and enough rest throughout the day. She should also have access to fresh food and water at all times. Employers can also ensure they communicate with their domestic worker with respect. Finally, the domestic worker should be free of the heavy recruitment fees that she's required to pay in order to seek employment in a Singaporean home. If you know of a domestic worker being abused or exploited, please call the home organisation immediately. We can all do our part as Singaporeans by respecting their basic rights. And it is an honor and privilege to be part of the Photo Voice. It started last year with Julio as our instructor. And at first, because I am not a photographer, Annabelle is. But then uh, it gave me a chance to realize that uh, photographs are not only photos, but there's a story behind all the photos that we take. And if you have seen the photos outside, uh, it uh, we share about story about our life here in Singapore, how we do our work, and our fa the family that we serve also, and the community that uh, goes along with us as well. And I'm so happy, and uh, I would like to thank you, Julio, for. Uh, bearing with us, you know, and waiting for us every Sunday to be part of this photo voice. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone. I'm Annabelle Cagle. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank Julio and Dominique and Home, of course, for giving me a chance to uh, use my, uh, not a talent, but a hobby. But, um, Sister Bridget is the one who told me that uh, I should do it, so she told me to uh, use it and do it to um, share it to um, my friends. And uh, I do volunteer as a photographer of home. And uh, of course, I also thank you, my employers, for uh, supporting me for this. Is there a Okay, so um, before we start the question and answer section, uh, I would like to invite our esteemed panel to join us on stage. We have with us today Jolovan Wem, Executive Director of the Humanitarian Organization for Migration Economics. We also have with us Celine Demine, a legal consultant for uh, home as well. 
On the panel today, we also have Professor Mohan J. Dara, Head of Communications and New Media Department and Director of Care. And last, but most importantly, we have with us Juvi Lavarius, an advisory board member for the Respect Our Rights campaign and ex domestic worker in Singapore, who played a lead role in our campaign. So before we start the panel session, can we have each of the panelists introduce themselves, their work and experience in the field regarding the nature of domestic work in Singapore? Uh, Jolhan, maybe we can start with you. Hello, good, oh, very loud. Hello, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for spending time um, with us. Um, I'm very grateful to the NUS care team led by Professor Mohan for initiating this campaign and for working with us and especially working so closely with the domestic workers because I think that's um, where the real change happens when the campaigns and the project mirrors uh, very closely their voices and their demands. Yeah, so I'm very grateful um, to have this opportunity to work with the NUS care team. Um, for myself, I've been involved in um, migrant rights work, um, and especially with domestic workers for the past 10 years. So um, I think over these past 10 years, we have seen um, some changes happen um, in the social landscape, especially with regard to attitudes towards domestic workers. I mean, clearly there are um, still, a, there's still a lot of discrimination, exploitation and abuse going on, as you've seen um, in the documentary. Yeah, but I think um, in the years that I've been involved in this um, home and other organisations um, who are involved in this work, um, we've done um, um, quite a fair bit of work to raise um, the profile of this issue um, so that domestic workers' voices are not marginalised. Um, we still have a, a long way to go because domestic workers are still excluded from um, labour legislation. Um, they are excluded from the Employment Act. So this means all the rights that we take for granted as regular employees are denied to them. Yeah. So, um, for example, the right to sick leave, annual leave, overtime pay, yeah, all the wage workers are entitled to that, but it's excluded from domestic workers. So this is uh, a fight, a struggle, which um, we continue to, um, to, uh, to fight for, um, because for us, um, domestic workers have to be recognised as workers and in order for that to happen they need to have equal rights as with all other employees but we're still quite a long, still quite a long way to go from that um, there's still a lot of problems as you've seen in the documentary um, the only thing that we've managed to I think um, um, win is uh, the weekly day off for domestic workers and this was legislated um, two years ago but even so that legislation has a lot of problems. Yeah? We hear from domestic workers that their day off is only from 10 in the morning to 4 in the evening. So there's no law that says how long their day off should be. And any domestic worker that tries to assert their right to a weekly day off um, run the risk of being dismissed and repatriated. Yeah? So there's clearly still a lot of um, things that need to be done. And um, how home responds to this is uh, we take a very comprehensive approach um, not only do we provide welfare services like our shelters, our counselling and our help desks, um, but we also get involved in public awareness, campaigning. We meet with the authorities regularly to express our concerns. In fact, this morning, Celine and I were just at the Manpower Ministry to talk about um, some of uh, the trafficking cases that we have seen and, try and communicating our concerns to them. Uh, what's happening on the ground, because we believe that by doing direct services, by hearing the voices of the workers, journeying with them through the claims process, we have an in-depth understanding of their experiences and what are the obstacles that they face. So this allows us to um, give um, to, to feedback very substantially yeah, to um, policy makers and authorities about what needs to be done in order for this situation, uh, the difficulties to be um, addressed at a systemic level. So, um, and what um, HOME is also doing is we realise that of course um, these problems do not just exist in Singapore, 
because um, a lot of the abuse and exploitation also happens in countries of origin. And for the women, when they go back to their countries, there's a lot of follow-up work that needs to be done. And we've never really had the resources to do that um, the past 10 years, but recently we have started to um, work more with organizations in the Philippines, in Indonesia, um, to assist these women when they go back to file claims, to file complaints, and, um, and also to look into their mental well-being. So, um, so yes, it's, it's really uh, uh, a, a, a problem that um, isn't just um, um, uh, co contained in Singapore. Yeah, and if we truly want to be comprehensive about how we deal with um, labor ex migrant labor exploitation, it requires partnership, not just within the local community, but also with um, foreign governments, local governments, and NGOs and community partners from around the region. So this is what we are trying to do in order to have a more comprehensive approach to the problem. So um, I think I'll, my three minutes is up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe you want to... Hello, good evening everyone. <laughs> I'm Juvi from Pangasinan, Philippines. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me here. I came here last 2010 to work as a domestic worker because I want to help my family back home especially my mother and father, who are taking care of my son. I had borrowed money from a loan shark to finance my papers and pay almost $500 to my agent in the Philippines. I had three employers. In my first employer, I didn't receive any pay for seven months because of salary reduction for the agent here in Singapore. They only give me allowance of a $10 a month, and I didn't have any day off. The three times in those two years that I was allowed to go out, I was only given three hours. So I always rush all the time to go back home. I work for my second employer for 17 months and only got paid $20 during the first eight months. So I was illegally deployed to work in the restaurant. And then at the same time, I'm working at home also. So I always tired. So I asked to change my employers. There was another salary deduction for three months when I transferred to my third employer. My mother did not want me to hold onto any of my money. So whenever I go for a day off, she would scan all my things, my pockets, everything to make sure I don't have anything else except the money she would give me. So my salary was supposed to $550, but she only gave me $200. And don't let me send money for my family. So what for that I'm working here? So when I come home, she scans again and over again, takes any money that I have left on my pocket. She said, this is so, it will be accused of stealing. So on my sixth month, I needed to renew my passport. She wanted me to pay $450 for it. But of course, I asked. The embassy told me it's only 102 so it's a big difference from 450, right? So I, I couldn't take it anymore for that because 450 for us here as a domestic worker is very big money. 
compared in 102. So we can do it in ourselves, right? So, so I need the money yet. The rest of my salary still was being kicked from me. I did not have a single centavo on me. So I decided to run away. I moved the shelter run by home last April 2014 and asked for help to collect my salary. It was a very painful for me of waiting for nine months. As my last employer told me that she will do everything for me to remain stuck here in Singapore. She filed so many cases, <laughs> all of which has been dismissed. Well, it was the home shelter. Of course, I don't want to, you know, like, to be affected. So I tried my best not to let my situation bring me down. Yeah, so I, I make myself busy. I make myself, you know, I participated in many activities such as sewing, baking, singing also. And computer classes. That is a very, very important also. Computer classes. I learned a lot. I learned so many things. So even I stay for nine months, I don't have a work, but I make it very special for me. I learned so much from home and care. So I also volunteered to help out at the shelter and at the home office. So through home, I became one of the pioneers of Photo Voice Project by NUS Care. I feel that because of all this, I become more confident and feel that I can do more and also be help to others like me. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Celine and I'm working with HOME as a legal consultant. I wanted to thank you all for coming tonight and thank you especially NUS Care and all the domestic workers who, who have been working on this project and who have put a lot of energy in this great work. Um, I was just sharing with Juvi, like, it seems like time is flying. I remember the first meeting we had in Waterloo Street where, when this project started. And so now a few months have passed and so much has been done. Um, about myself, I'm a migrant worker myself, uh, as you might have guessed with my accent. I'm from Belgium and I'm working with home on different legal projects. Uh, all these projects are related to access to justice and employment of migrant workers. In terms of access to justice, there are many barriers um, for access to justice um, for migrant workers. So a few of the projects that we are conducting uh, are done in collaboration with Singapore pro bono lawyers. We are grateful to have lawyers who want um, to put pro bono hours to work for migrant worker community. We have set up a legal clinic where migrant worker can um, come in and get legal advice on their case. And we get pro bono lawyer also to represent migrant worker in court. The idea is really to bring more cases to court and also bring systematic changes in the implementation of the laws. Um, you have heard, for example, about cases of domestic worker who have been physically abused and we are, who are going home penniless. Uh, actually, if domestic worker want to file civil claims to get monetary compensation, they need a pro bono lawyer to represent them. 
and we want to bring these kind of cases to court and get, for example, monetary um, compensation for them. As Jonathan mentioned, uh, migrants worker are obviously crossing border and we don't want access to justice to finish when they are going home. So we have started this collaboration with NGO and lawyers in countries of origin. We want them either to be able to file complaint and to have access to remedies in their countries, would it be against the employment agent or third parties? And we want them as well if uh, they return to the country but still want to continue civil claim here in Singapore, we want them to be able to do so. And we need for this uh, collaboration with uh, our partner in um, receiving and sending country. We are also bringing the voice of uh, migrants worker in our advocacy work. Um, we hear many stories and we want these stories to be heard at the national level but also at an international level. We are working, for example, uh, with submission to some of the UN committee as a grassroots organization. We want um, the stories of migrants workers in Singapore to be heard at this uh, international level. Another aspect maybe of the work is also empowerment of migrant worker. And we have set up this interesting project with um, NUS law students who are uh, studying nearby. It's a project called Law and You, where actually law students um, have set up workshop for domestic worker on their rights and responsibility here in Singapore. I see some of the um, faces of our domestic worker who have already attended this workshop. We are also working on the, the topic which is uh, trafficking in person. You've heard a lot about trafficking in person in the documentary. And I'm happy to report that since the release of uh, this documentary, a new step has been taken with um, the Prevention of Human Trafficking Act, uh, which has been published and will be uh, coming to force in March 2015. It's a first step. We've been campaigning for some change in this act, um, change like more rights for victims of human trafficking, and we will continue to do so in the future. Thank you. I want to take a moment to thank you for coming uh, to this event and for your support. I want to begin by uh, thanking our NGO partners home uh, in this case who have been tremendous and amazing in supporting us in doing this work. We wouldn't be here doing this had it not been for home. And I think a lot of the changes that you see is because of NGOs like home. We also have our partners HealthServe back there who put a, a lot in line and a lot at stake uh, to actually be doing this work that is bold and uh, courageous and hopefully makes a difference in creating a space. So I want to talk about uh, care a little bit and about the culture-centered approach and then use that as a basis to talk about uh, the domestic workers and what we have been observing with uh, voices of domestic workers. And you already heard uh, Juby's voice sort of articulating some of these points. So the culture-centered approach makes a pretty simple argument that uh, we as academics often uh, take stories from marginalized people and turn them into academic papers to sell them uh, to benefit our own causes without really giving back uh, to the communities that we take from. So the culture-centered approach really begins from that commitment that um, the stories that you take have an ethic of making a difference in the lives of the people in whom or with whom you participate in creating these stories. So the idea behind the culture-centered approach in some ways is pretty simple. You often see experts reporting surveys or through qualitative analysis, reporting studies. Those often then become the voices of experts who sit behind those uh, journals and articulate their views. So you might have panels, for instance, like this at places like NUS, where you will see a bunch of academics sitting around and uh, uh, pontificating about the condition of domestic workers. So the CCA says that, well, let's invert the table by first putting the people that we are talking about at the table. So it's a communicative idea. 
right? That uh, by putting the people that you're talking about at the table, you disrupt uh, this silence that we ourselves participate in uh, carrying out. So the idea there is that by giving Juvi a space to articulate her views and uh, to create a space within an academic setting, you disrupt this notion of elite academic theorizing, academic research in the ivory tower. Change then comes from that very standpoint. So this project began about two years ago really, uh, working with uh, domestic workers, trying to listen to their voices and what happens is we put together an advisory board of uh, foreign domestic workers who start documenting and talking about their stories. Then they come up with a series of problems that they identify as problems they want to work on and then the solutions they want to create. So the key thing in the documentary that you observed is that the storyline of the documentary, the narratives and the images come from the articulations of the domestic workers. So we are not experts sitting there telling them this is what it's going to be and this is how things are going to be done, but rather they are in charge of the storytelling process and of the narrative. And we argue that that is fundamental to communicative inversion or inverting the inequality of communication. Because uh, in many ways, the plight of domestic workers, and when you listen to Juvi's story, uh, the common thread in this plight is uh, communicative inequality. And domestic workers talk about this as not having that dignity to articulate uh, what they feel are their rights, not having the space to share uh, their stories, to talk about uh, their stories. So consistent through the themes throughout um, these uh, uh, last year of our project has been this idea of the dignity of domestic work. Uh, this notion that when you go into work, you expect to be respected. You should do the same for us. You should give us the basic dignity that is tied to our work. Another idea, and this kind of uh, got highlighted in both what Jolovan uh, articulated as well as what Celine articulated, is this idea of access to communicative spaces. So the spaces of communication and justice are unequal. So when you think about access to law and legal processes, such as access to civil claims in legal contexts, the space and the context of access to that space is unequal, such that there are actually differences in terms of what Juvi can or cannot do. Uh, the question then becomes, can she uh, file a lawsuit against her employer who's been accusing her three, four, five times, one after another of different kinds of complaints about theft? And then the question becomes, what are the communicative inequalities that are built into that kind of inaccess? The final point I want to sort of wrap up with is that, you know, as you watched in the documentary, there were multiple themes, themes of inaccess to food, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and not being given the time to read their contract, being promised a certain amount in the salary, but being given a salary that was dramatically lower than what was promised. In all of these, what Juvi and her friends came up with was the idea that all of these is bound together by this idea of the lack of dignity of domestic workers. So a consistent theme that they kept articulating is, if you want to change this space, start by getting people to give us a dignity and to respect us for the rights that we have as workers. So in that sense, you know, when we started the campaign, the idea behind the campaign was very simple, that you talk back to the structures that have erased you. So the target audience, you know, in the campaign, you typically talk about who is the target audience of your campaign. For them, the target audience was everyday Singaporeans and expats that hire uh, domestic workers and they had a message for them. And the message was that um, if you're hiring a domestic worker, you need to treat them just as with the rights of workers as you would like yourself to be treated as a worker. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very informative discussion and um, introduction. Um, I think we will start with the question and answer session from the floor. Um, if you could introduce yourself before you ask the question, that will be helpful. Maybe we could start off the first question with, from somebody from the floor. If not, I will ask the first question. Hi, I'm uh, Lawrence Young from Sociology Department. 
thank you for coming here and all the interesting presentation. Um, I think I always have a billionaire question about uh, every time we have a panel of this, the audience here, they are already a, a selected group. You're pitching to the converted, the choir. So, uh, so the big, big question bothers me is that how, how do you outreach to a wider audience and uh, how do you get them to uh, understand these kind of issues? Uh, so then their voices get heard. So we're still confined within the academic environment. So we're limited by that. Raise a great point, and um, there's of course the limit in terms of whom you're reaching out to. So there are two parts to this campaign which we think are interesting. One is that we ran a series of advertisements on uh, Star Hub uh, television, so the campaign was national in scope. We also were able to reach out through print ads in, uh, say, a space like Straits Times, as well as through social media. Now we did run uh, an initial set of analyses with um, uh, the data that we gathered. So we gathered uh, uh, national level data in terms of uh, the evaluation of the campaign. So we observe a couple of things. One is that exposure to the messages do seem to change uh, attitudes uh, somewhat. The change is small, but surely there is change in attitudes in terms of what you think about uh, rights of domestic workers. Having said that, I think uh, the struggle continues in terms of really making sure that you're reaching out to the people uh, that need reaching out to. That's one part. The other part is really uh, reaching out to policymakers because it really seems that, you know, you take the day off, the notion of day off, that the policy is in place, but it is really in the implementation of the policy that there are lots of gaps. So that's one question perhaps uh, Celine and Joloman could address is how do you then go about reaching particular stakeholders and ensuring that the policy is being implemented? Um, outreach is something which um, I think home um, feels is very important if we want to get this kind of change. So we try as much as possible, of course, not to just preach um, to the converted. So um, one of the things that we do um, is we work quite closely with uh, mainstream and social media um, to communicate our messages. And um, we try as much as we can also to um, talk to um, schools. Yeah, there's, there's the schools will let us in. Um, and I think one way in which we can try and reach to a wider audience beyond this is if you know, if there are any lecturers or professors here, we could come into your classes you know, to talk to your students because not all students uh, would be interested to come for an event like that. Yeah, so if you could kind of like, you know, um, allow us to, to, to penetrate, you know, your class and spread our propaganda, <laughs> yeah, we'd be very happy to, to do that. Yeah, so this is really an open invitation. Yeah, so if you'd like to bring us in, we'd be very happy to talk and I'd uh, be very happy to bring in, you know, um, the migrant worker volunteers. You know, we have quite a number of them here in the audience, the domestic workers and also um, the other foreign workers that we help. So they can present together with us, then you can actually hear their voices and understand uh, their experiences. Okay. Hi, I'm Bubbles. I'm also from the Department of Sociology. Um, I'm, I'm just very interested in how what kind of reflexive uh, practices or strategies that you employed whereby uh, the migrant collaborators, as you call them, uh, can depart from the, being, the feeling of victimization? And um, I think the question is related to whose voice is it? Is it the voice for or the voice of the, the migrants? I think this is a perennial issue that, you know, all migrant organizations uh, encounter and fix. 
Thank you very much. And thank you so much for sharing your, your work with us. And it's very enlightening, especially for our students here. Yeah, of sociology and migration. And it's a very good <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that great question. So, share perhaps uh, three tools that we use. You know, we uh, talk about uh, tools of dialogue, uh, tools of listening, and tools of reflexivity and journaling. So, you know, the way we start the process in the very beginning is to simply begin by sharing stories. And, um, uh, you know, domestic workers sit together in an advisory board and talk about the stories and their lived experiences and begin pretty open-ended with the kinds of questions they would like to see asked. From that point then, they become almost like our professors and we become their research team. So they design a certain set of research uh, questions as well as um, uh, questions that they would like to see answered. Uh, we go out then and try to find ways of gathering those through in-depth interviews, focus groups, or surveys. For instance, I'll give you an example. You know, in the very uh, beginning in the stories, uh, they kept talking about this idea that uh, uh, contracts, most of them did not have a chance to even read their contract. So then, you know, that became an interesting point in the sense that uh, we wanted to know, or they wanted to know, how many domestic workers experienced this, that they actually don't have a chance to read the contract. So they commissioned a survey that we then began in terms of trying to really figure out how many domestic workers have a chance to read the contract and understand it. So that's one part of the process, you know, beginning the research process that way. As they are doing this, they start writing stories and sharing. But it not only takes textual form in terms of writing, but they also work with Julio on photo voice in starting to take images. So these various modes of communication and expression uh, they participate in and they bring these together again to uh, talk about in a group and brainstorm. So this took us almost about um, a year to sort of brainstorm on and think through what are the kinds of problems they want to work on. And it began uh, by a certain set of problems that would change. So it was a pretty dynamic process in that sense. Once they uh, zero in on what they want to work on and what kinds of solutions they want to create, then we talk about things like, I'll give you an example. So in coming up with a documentary or they said that, okay, so even the mode of communication that they want to use advertisements or they want to use print ads, they come up with the idea of what they want, right? So at that point, then we uh, bring in our expertise in terms of, okay, what does it take to put together a print ad? So what are the nuts and bolts? We share it with them, and then they go through a series of reflective exercises in putting together print ads. And then they vote on which ones they like and how they want to go about it. Then our research team and production team comes in, executes it, brings it back to them, and then they select. So the idea behind this is you, know, you try to build a reflexivity within throughout the process. But also part of this, you see, is also our reflexivity. How much role, because this is not just tabula rasa, uh, uh, domestic workers without us, right? We are involved in this process. So we also journal in terms of what experiences we are going through and how we are negotiating that and share it with them. So this process of going back and forth is what we really do. But of course, recognizing in all of this, there are tremendous power inequalities. At the end of the day, you know, we are researchers, um, home is our um, NGO partner, and then you have domestic workers, and there are power inequalities there as well, you know. Jyoti, did you want to add anything about that process from your viewpoint? Because the like processing of everything before we go abroad, like the mm, papers and all that, so you need you need to search everything if uh, if what is the right right term and then right way also. Because if you go in the wrong way, like what happened to me, I never, you know, I never research and so I want to go abroad only. So I just only grab it, whatever it takes. So I just only accept it. So uh, my my advice for the domestic worker is need to to do something that 
cannot ne they never bully you <laughs> or apply abroad. And then uh, read, read properly. If you sign something, you must understand. And then read because the Asian is they never let you read properly. They just only ask you sign this, sign here. Only a second or you just only sign you like that. So what is the time that you can understand what is inside, right? Yeah, so must understand and must read first before sign anything. And that's all. Hello, yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Lubudi Chi. I'm from the political science department. Uh, this question, I guess I want to address the, the, the concept or the question of access to justice. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting term that, you know, that I picked up from the documentary and from the speakers. So I guess this question is for Julie and for Celine and uh, Jolivan. Um, I guess for Julie first, um, uh, when you went back home to the Philippines, did you approach the POEA or the NLRC about your case? Uh, and what was, I mean, and if you did, what happened? And for Celine and Jolivan, um, my understanding is that uh, the only recourse to justice would be if a case were to be filed to the MOM. Is there any other way aside from that? Because it seems that I mean, it was um, it, uh, I mean, it was mentioned in the documentary that sometimes it can take us almost two years. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I went to PUA and OWA last time before I come here. So I didn't expect also that they still can do the illegal things. Mm. I went also to the uh, PIDOS and everything. So the seven months that they deduct from me, so I'm expecting that all that is correct. Because I only want the time to go abroad, to earn money. Actually, I finished my contract by two years, so I, don't, I didn't go back home that time. In my second, is still they still took from me is eight months so i just only work here for the agent so even you went to poa and all that yeah it's not really sure so you must uh search you must ask you must know everything Yes, so in terms of um, avenue for redress, uh, you seem to be familiar with the Filipino context, so obviously it's um, something, uh, an area where we are developing partnership for all um, the Filipino domestic worker who sign a first contract in the Philippines. And I mean, in terms of numbers, it's like thousands of Filipino domestic worker uh, who come to Singapore and first sign a contract in the Philippines with the prospective employer in Singapore. And under the Filipino regulation, um, they have a con template contract which states a minimum salary of uh, 400 US dollar, which is 500 Sing dollar. They have eight hours uh, mandatory rest. They have one mandatory day of a week and also an important regulation regula uh, re related to placement fees. So under Filipino regulation, Filipino domestic worker cannot uh, be asked to pay placement fee for employment agent. And the majority, if not uh, all of the domestic worker who have signed this contract when they arrived in Singapore, are asked to sign a new contract. And under this new contract, their salary might be less than $500. And for almost all of them, they will have to pay placement fees, meaning that during the six, seven, eight months of employment, they will not receive any salary, just an allowance of 10 or $20. Sing dollar. 
and the money is actually um, used to repay placement fee to the employment agent. So this is something that is, uh, has been happening for years and we have been complaining to MOM and not helping domestic workers when they are back to the Philippines to file a complaint with the POE and with the Philippines authorities and we have also been helping domestic workers to file complaints here at the Philippines Embassy. So that's some of the avenue uh, we are uh, using. But in terms of redress, uh, you were asking like what kind of redress are accessible. It really depends on the complaint, on the type of complaint. They can either file a claim to MOM or to the police, or they can also think about filing a civil case. So it really dep depends on uh, the nature of the complaint. And in terms of uh, process uh, and the times it takes to resolve some claims, I think in the documentary we've heard about domestic worker who have been physically abused. And typically, in our experience, when a domestic worker uh, file a police report for physical abuse, uh, investigation with, by the police will take uh, about nine months to a year. And then if the case is brought to court, also the process in court might take a year to two years. And during this time, domestic workers um, stay at a shelter. Some of them have the right to work, but um, they only have the right to work as a domestic worker. And for many of them who have faced physically ab physical abuse, the prospect of going back to um, a private house and working for a private employer is sometimes uh, very difficult. So that's uh, where comes our advocacy work, where uh, we meet regularly stakeholders uh, for this uh, physical abuse case. We have had several meetings with the police, with AGC, in order to address um, our uh, concern and ask for um, to look into this case to be expedited. And also some of the case might not know, we might be in the future process under the Prevention of Human Trafficking Act. And that's something we will be looking into it for sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add in relation to access to justice. I think one of the main problems as I see it is that um, the system always assumes there's an um, equal balance of power, and that's never the case. Yeah, whether it's in Singapore or in the Philippines or in Indonesia. In Singapore, for example, in a domestic worker files a complaint, and then the mediation is arranged. And the officer in charge of the case often takes on the so-called neutral approach, yeah, but not acknowledging that um, the employer may have more, more power, more knowledge, more resources to be able to um, get things going his or her way, yeah, whereas the domestic workers are unable to do so. When I went to the Philippines um, um, sometime early last year, I um, assisted a domestic worker to file a complaint at POEA. So I was um, quite fortunate to have been able to go into the mediation room yeah, to see how the mediation was conducted. And again, um, the, the officer in the POEA office um, takes on a very neutral kind of Approach. Yeah, and then the, employ the employment agency um, that was the other party um, had a lawyer with him. Yeah, and the domestic worker didn't. Yeah, so of course in such a situation, um, the domestic worker is disadvantaged and would be willing and would have sometimes feel that she has no choice but to accept a lower amount. Yeah, so I think this is one of the key issues. Even though you know um, governments like to say, oh, this we have mechanisms in place to ensure that justice is done. Yeah, but the balance of power often is tilted very much in favour of um, the employer or the agent, simply because they have more resources and are able to articulate their concerns better yeah, than the worker. Yeah. Thank you. Could we have the next question, please? Hello. Hi, my name is Chris Sherman. I I'm actually a law student, so my question will naturally progress from the earlier question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you have some interactions with MOM. You regularly interact with them uh, with regards to the various legal issues 
uh, in some of the civil themes, etc. Uh, I'd just like to flip this around, and I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned as well that many of them sign contracts in the Philippines, and when they come to Singapore, they have contracts that are substantially, that substantially different terms. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there any scope, based on your interaction with MOM, to legislatively mandate that the foreign domestic workers who come here are educated on the terms of their contract? Because many of the times, the civil claims that arise come about after the, the, the incident, the events have occurred. That's a very uh, post-anti uh, action. Uh, are you looking at more preventive avenues? For instance, uh, finding ways in which the mates can um, re receive some basic legal education or what their rights are. And do you see any space for that? Yes, in terms of contract substitution, I don't think we will be seeing any legislative change soon. This is seen as a private matter. And and for now, um, well, this is seen as a private matter and no change are going to, to be addressed. As we see it, um, the only way to address this issue should be to have a bilateral agreement between the Singapore government and the Philippines government. But um, this is something we are still asking for. In terms of education, you are right. Um, actually, uh, that's something we are working on. It's important of uh, migrants workers themselves and for them to know their rights and stand up for their rights. And we have set up this uh, legal workshop for domestic work on their rights and responsibility in Singapore. And I think, yeah, through education, um, you can bring change, but as Jolivan mentioned, I think that the, um, you need to take into consideration the um, difference between um, the balance and, and the power that the employer and employee have. Because actually, let's take uh, the scenario where a domestic worker wants to assert a right when she arrives here in Singapore and say, you know, I'm not going to sign this contract. I have signed a contract in Philippines and I want, you know, don't want to sign this new contract, then the employer can just say, well, if you're not happy with this, I cancel your work permit, and I send you back home within a few hours. So it's not only about um, empowerment, it's also about um, legislative change, I guess. I just only want to share about PIDOS that before 2010, so PIDOS is just, we, they orient us before we go in, in here in Singapore. So all about culture or what we gonna do if uh, the employer is, have the culture that something different from Philippines. So we need to, to, to know and then uh, we need to practice also. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this PDOS, which Julie has shared, it's a pre-departure orientation seminar. So there's actually scope yeah, for domestic workers to um, know what they're coming into. Yeah, but the problem with this pre-departure orientation seminar, which the government of the Philippines has um, instituted, is that it doesn't really reflect what's happening here. So one of the things that we've been telling them is that we need to, you need to work with the NGOs in the sending country so that, to help you develop the curriculum so that they actually get real, actual, accurate information. Because I think at the moment, the, the seminar is a one-size-fits-all approach. So if you're going to the Middle East, you're going to Korea, you're going to the US, or whatever, you know, so everyone seems to go through the same program. So we don't think um, that is useful at all. And also, in order for um, the workers here to have access to justice based on what the countries of origin um, have um, legislated for them, the Singapore government must actually acknowledge it and be willing to enforce it. Yeah, but that's the problem at the moment because the contracts that they sign in the Philippines is mandated by their government, but the Singapore government here doesn't recognise it. So then when they come here, they get substituted 
And the Singapore government says there's nothing wrong with that because um, our laws um, allow that to happen. So we don't have an MOU with the Philippines, for instance, to ensure that the contracts over there can be enforced um, and will be respected here and will not be substituted. So this, the, the same for Burmese domestic workers, for example. There is actually a ban. Yeah, the Burmese government has actually banned domestic workers from coming to Singapore. But Singapore doesn't um, acknowledge this ban. Yeah, so they continue to issue work permits for Burmese domestic workers coming in. So we really need to have intergovernmental cooperation if we want to tackle these issues effectively. But at a bilateral and a multilateral level, uh, this isn't happening. Yeah, so like Celine mentioned, when they come here, you know, they don't really have the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to sign this contract. Because if you don't sign it, then you go back. Yeah? And, and the law allows that. So they don't have a right to seek redress yeah, for, for dismissals which are unfair or wrong. So, so the structural changes, the, the, the legislation, the policy has to facilitate the empowerment. Yeah? Because they can only be empowered if they are uh, working and living in an environment that allows that to happen. But unfortunately, structurally, um, these policies and practices are not in place. So domestic workers often find it very difficult to resist yeah, because they are hemmed in by all these um, unhelpful um, structures. Yeah. Thank you, Chonaman. We have time for two more questions. Hi, uh, my name is Sabrina. I'm from the Global Studies Department at NUS. And I'd really like to thank NUS Care and Home for the documentary. It, was, it really exposed the issues of exploitation faced by foreign domestic workers here. And um, a few of the takeaways I felt, especially the part in the documentary where um, the foreign domestic worker was talking about when guests uh, come home and she's locked up or hidden. And it really makes you feel disempowered about how where this exploitation is happening in a private space. And I feel like as a student and particularly interested, we come for these events and we find out more about these issues. But what role do we play as youth and where we have more of a, we don't have such an influence on, say, policy or intergovernmental negotiation, but rather on the ground. So what role do you think uh, and your, like university students and youth play in this issue of exploitation? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think you have a big role to play. And the fact that you are here is part of a big role to play. That um, in everyday context, you go back home or you have friends who uh, hire domestic workers. Part of that is changing attitudes, beliefs. What you fundamentally believe is uh, the position of a domestic worker in your life world. And I think as advocates and as the youth, you have a great role to play in changing that. Uh, but I also think that as youth, you have a great role to play in changing policy and uh, uh, changing structures and in informing these structures and making sure that structures are accountable uh, to creating a just and a fair space, you know. Um, so I want to sort of tie back to the earlier point a little bit to give you an example. You know, in the documentary, you saw that in many instances, domestic workers, when they come in, they don't even get to read their contracts, right? So boom, 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 you go through the pages, you're signed, so you go to the education question. I mean, that very point of implementation, you don't have any rights, basically. You're signing off on something and you're being forced to sign off on something, right? So as the youth, now that you're aware and you have this piece of information, you have an ethic to make change. So the question is going to be, what is that entry point uh, for that change? Are you going to do a Facebook campaign, a Twitter campaign, talk to people? You have many avenues today to make that change. probably can have just one more right after this question. Hi, my name is Hui, and I'm from the US, and I'm from the sociology department. Oh, no, I'm from sociology. And, um, <laughs> sorry, I've got a question. Um, are there any outreach programs whereby NGOs actually collaborate with MIG agencies? Because MIG agencies are actually the mediators between employers and employees. And more often than not, MIG agencies are very unwilling to help their, um, their mates when it's actually their part of their responsibility to do so. Thank you. 
Yes, I think um, agencies actually play such a crucial role because many employers depend on them for advice. Yeah, so agencies are the ones that actually shape behaviour of employers and also shape um, and, and help to facilitate the employment relationship between the worker and the, and the employer. So I mean, we have seen um, 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 employment agencies like, uh, like there's this employment agency called Great Link. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to, to spread bad news about them. Yeah, because they do things like, you know, write a list of don'ts yeah, for domestic workers and say, you cannot have a boyfriend, you shouldn't pray so many times a day, you, uh, you shouldn't um, answer back to your employers. So you have agencies that, you know, that actually give such bad advice. And, and they will tell um, domestic workers that they shouldn't, uh, they tell employers that domestic workers shouldn't have a day off during the first six months because um, if she, um, she still has to pay off the loan and if she goes out, she might get all kinds of funny ideas or you know, she might run away, she might get a boyfriend, she get pregnant and all that kind of thing. So, so the agencies will often give this kind of advice to the employers you know, to restrict their rights. Yeah, so for me, the agency actually plays is such an important role in ensuring that um, the rights of the domestic workers are upheld. But unfortunately, um, there is a lot of um, um, discrimination going on. There are a lot, there's a lot of um, um, racism also, um, of course, I mean, class bias definitely. And, um, and this kind of discrimination you even see in how wages are determined, right? Like Filipino domestic workers get higher wages than Indonesians and Burmese and South Asians because, and they perpetuate that kind of stereotypes about different nationalities. So, so yes, we have tried to engage with um, employment agencies, but it hasn't been easy. Yeah? And I think for home also because many of the domestic workers, they run away to us for help. Yeah? And then the agencies get upset. Yeah, I say, why did you go to home? Why didn't you come to us? Yeah, and I'm like, well, they didn't go to you because you were providing a service to them. Yeah, because you were abusing them, right? So you don't help them at all. So I think it's, um, it, it, is a, it is a very difficult challenge and we've tried to approach um, agencies at a more collective level, like engaging with the employment of, um, the Association of Employment Agencies. So, um, I mean, we have been able to, um, in, in these meetings, um, establish some kind of dialogue and some kind of understanding about the about um, issues which we find problematic. And I think one of the things which we were able to agree on was that the recruitment fees are too high. Yeah, the association of employment agencies themselves feel that MOM should cap it at a much lower level. Yeah, um, the employment agencies act actually does cap placement fees but they are at two months maximum, but many agencies are able to go around this legislation by disguising the rest of the debts as loans. Yeah, so it's a private loan, it's not really an agency fee. Yeah, so, so in our dialogue with the association, they agree that agencies doing this is wrong. Yeah, but they say that it's very difficult for them to control their members, and uh, what MOM should do is to really enforce and um, the, the legislation and ensure that the domestic worker doesn't pay more than two months. Yeah. So I think there is some, some scope yeah, in, for us to work together and we have found some space in which we agree with one another but at this point we haven't been able to partner with them in, in a very substantial way in terms of getting policy um, to change or getting the practices of uh, many of these agencies to change. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have two burning questions, one from the front and one from the back. So if you could make a bit of time for them. Oh. Um, hi, my name is Yun. I'm Singaporean. I'm not from NUS. I'm from Holland Village. <laughs> uh, I'm a friend of Gilda and I got to know her by dog walking. My dog. Um, thank you everyone for providing this event and the documentary. Um, one question is, Will you be showing this to the public? Um, is it going to be on YouTube or Facebook where I can share the link with everyone? Because um, honestly, most people on the street don't know the basic rights of foreign domestic workers. It's a cultural attitude, I think, because Asians are ingrained with second-class citizens, slaves. You know, we are used to having people 
um, the caste system. And um, I think this documentary is very important for just showing the uncles and aunties who watch TV on Channel 5, not just on Starhub, but Channel 5, Channel 8, Channel News Asia. Um, you know, this documentary, not just in English, but with maybe Chinese subtitles, Malay, um, because, uh, you know, uh, you'd be surprised that a lot of HDB residents who employ um, domestic workers don't speak English. And they expect that all these are, you know, it's the norm, it's normal. You cannot trust the workers. Yeah. And I can see the difference between, say, an expatriate family who employs a foreign domestic worker compared to a Singaporean local family. Doesn't matter whether it's a HDB flat or a condo or a landed property. Okay, thank you. That's a great point. So we are going to pull up our uh, Facebook uh, page of the campaign uh, that has the videos that are also available on YouTube, including the documentary being on YouTube. Um, we have talked about the possibility of getting the documentary through MDA so that it is licensed, so that we have opportunities of actually showing it uh, in spaces. The other point you bring up is a great point, and we really struggled with that, which was uh, whether to have Channel News Asia and um, uh, uh, you know sort of the Chinese language media and the Malay language media, and we sort of went with what was the easiest for us in some ways. But I think that certainly is one of the next steps of the project is to actually translate this and make it be available in uh, the local languages as well. Great points. I think we have uh, one last question. Two last questions. I'm very sorry, but I think we have uh, a bit of struggle deciding on who gets to get the mic. <laughs> All right, just bear with me for a very quick question. So my, name is, yeah, my name is Andrew, I come from the Nanyang Technological University, a formerly a proud graduate from CNM as well. Yeah, so the first question I'd like to ask is about the... Uh, Alright, one question. Right? One question I'll give him, okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so the question which I want to ask is about engage, engagement of stakeholders. So far I've been talking about the engagement from the ground up, which is the foreign domestic workers themselves, and also from the policy level, which is the uh, uppermost, if I would say. And also one of the questions raised was that about the uh, employment agencies, the engagement as well. But one very fundamental uh, stakeholder, which I think the foreign domestic worker can relate to most, is that of the employer. So what are the steps in which home uh, can sort of possibly take to engage the employer rather, I mean, they're just using awareness campaigns, you know, we may create awareness campaigns, but oh, it's almost like watching a movie, you watch a movie, after that, you go back, you have some feelings about it, but the next day we wake up, it's back to normal again. And the same thing for policies, and actually I do find from my uh, own research on academics as well, that policies sometimes do have a counterintuitive, uh, intuitive effect, in that, you know, because the employers, they are disgruntled because of certain legislation that are passed on, then they pass on that anger and the frustration to the foreign domestic workers itself, so it has a negative effect. So what are the ways in which we can engage the employees to, uh, you know, sort of uh, help seek redress for the domestic workers? Um, with, with employers, I think they are actually one of the most, more difficult groups to engage because um, employers or domestic workers are usually individuals. They're not like companies, yeah. So, um, so it's more difficult to reach out to them, and whether they want to actually talk to you is another thing altogether. So we do have some, um, employers that we talk to, but they tend to be the ones who are supportive, right? The ones who are actually on your side. So the ones that are not on your side, they don't even want to see you. So, um, so that has been a, a struggle for us. Um, with agencies, at least they have an association, right? So it's easy to engage them. Um, but there's no association of um, domestic worker employers. So there is SNEF, which is the Singapore National Employers Federation, but they're made up of corporate, um, I mean corporations, yeah, and, and, and employers of domestic workers clearly have no interest to join an association like this. So, um, so in terms of engagement employers, yeah, it's tough because the only thing we can do really is just to um, target the public at large because this is where the employers are and also prospective employers. So until um, employers get together, I think it might be a bit difficult to engage them in a, uh, as a collective 
body. I mean, we get a lot of um, accusations from employers that, oh, we only cite, oh, you always cite the mate, you always cite the mate, so they always say that to us, right? Then I will tell them, why you go and set up your own, own group, lah. Yeah, you start your own group of employer association because they say that we always fight for the workers, don't fight for them. And I'm like, but we are an NGO for workers, so why would we be fighting for you, right? You have the power to, to organize yourselves and come together to promote your own interests. So why don't you do that? In fact, when you do that, it's easy for us to engage you. So, so yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, but um, employers clearly also, if they, if they want to promote their interests, they need to get their, their act together. But until that happens, I think the best approach is to um, engage the public at large. Yeah. Okay, very aptly, we are ending this session with the last question from the photographer of this poster. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask Professor Mohamed, since they are all my friends there, so I don't, need to, I don't need to ask you three there, only Professor Mohan. Okay, I'm involved, I'm involved in this uh, project, yeah? the photo session and everything. My last question is, what's next? Yeah. After you go deep into this process, you go deep into the migrants issue, what's next? Because we are here for 10 years, home is already 10 years, and we see how weekly day off, it's a long journey, long fight. 10 years, I think, yeah, Jalovan? Yeah. Then after you go in, then what is next? I know that you involved in so many projects, you go to India or what, but what about this migrant issue? Because I think university have more natural penetration to the community, especially the Singapore now. Migrants is like common enemy in the community. Thanks. I think Dominika, thank you for that question, and uh, that's a great point. So. Uh, just to sort of wrap up, we have already been conversing about starting the next step of the campaign. Uh, again, we will go back to our advisory board and start working on a particular issue. So you saw the documentary highlight a variety of issues. So we will pick up one particular issue and that will be the issue frame that we will work on on the next step of the campaign. It's probably it could be something like the contracts and the implementation of the contracts. Or it could be uh, the food food rights, or it could be uh, having access to uh, the money that you're promised and making sure you're earning that money. So any of these, again, it depends upon what our advisory board comes up with the next, but certainly this is just the beginning of the campaign, the uh, starting point, and we hope to see a lot more out of it coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank our panel for taking the time to join us today, especially Juwi, who has flown in all the way from Philippines last evening uh, to be with us today. We would also like to extend a small token of appreciation for Jolavan, Celine, and Juwi. Could I invite Professor Mohan on stage to hand out the tokens of appreciation? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have found this panel session and screening informative and useful, especially in understanding the context and problems of domestic work in Singapore. I would like to thank each of you for joining us today. To find out more about CARE, our researchers are distributing flyers from on the right and left hand sides of the auditorium as well as on the reception table. We would also like to invite everyone to like the Facebook page as well as to have a view of our Respect Our Rights website yeah, and the Facebook page as well. Thank you very much and we hope to see you at our next event. <laughs>